Matt is talking about quitting YouTube and becoming a stay-at-home husband. Thomas Frank said he is just quitting. Seth Godin talks about abracadabra magic and talks about the magic of arguing your way into a hole. Simon Sinek again doesn't agree with a commonly used term, this time it's soft skills. Burnout is on a lot of people's minds, but Anne talks about bore out instead. Stephen Coulter went really deep on the brain talking about neurochemical, neuroelectrical, and neuroatomical changes in the brain and gave us a little speech reading hack too. Ali contributed to the flow state conversation, but said something that I have a couple of thoughts about. The idea of living like a corporate athlete was brought up, and there are loads of note-taking and knowledge highlights digging into the world of pedagogy. Matt announced he almost quit YouTube because he was questioning the path he was on. There's possibly a little bit of burnout in there, but when I think to last week, with Joey from Better Ideas talking about his creative slump and needing to get out to freshen up ideas, I think it just reinforces the notion that we can't really sit in what we're doing. We need change, we need challenge in some way. But speaking of change, Thomas Frank has stopped his podcast. It's ended. It's finished. There are three more episodes and then it's over. Thomas and Martin will be talking about the dip from Seth Godin in the next episode, but they mentioned at the end of the last episode they had a discussion and that's what's triggered this sudden stop. An eight long year run is now over, but Thomas did say that his new found time will be used to increase the schedule or be a little bit more consistent with the schedule on the main channel, which is very nice using Beeminder, which we saw him use last week. I am sure the discussion point between Martin and Thomas was a big one, but as Seth Godin also said this week, you believe more what you say. So be careful what you argue because you could be digging yourself a hole. I know I have done that in the past and I will probably do it in the future. And don't you lie to yourself. You've argued with someone just for the sake of arguing because you can, or you've said something that wasn't backed up by research, and you've dug yourself a hole by trying to prove yourself right even though you don't know. And doubling down on something that's wrong just makes things worse. You see, the hallmark of a productive conversation isn't persuasion, it's insight. Making someone change their mind is an extremely large and challenging task because you are challenging their philosophy, their life philosophy, the reasons that they make the choices that they do, and you're asking them to change it. Is that going to be a short process? Hell no! Most of us will defend our philosophy and our choices as a natural instinct. So a victory in conversation is when everyone has deeper understanding. Maybe that's more synthesis in their point some questions they need to challenge themselves about, or maybe they just realize, oh, I actually need to look into this a bit more. My justification isn't quite valid. I know when I hear something that disagrees with my philosophy, I get defensive. It's just a natural instinct, but I always try to be curious. And this image shared by Adam Grant from Lisa and Molly was a really nice way to illustrate that conflict in conversation. Speaking of conflict, I feel like Simon Sinek just takes a term that all of us want to believe in and like to use and just turns it on its head. This time it's being soft skills. He goes on to explain that hard skills are those skills you develop in work that help you get the work done. But soft skills aren't soft. They're actually quite difficult, some of them, and they are human skills that require you to become a better human. And he then goes on to explain the balance between hard skills and human skills, looking at performance hard skills, and then trust human skills. Someone with high performance and high trust obviously being someone you want to work with. Someone with low performance and low trust, not so much. But then there is a balance in the middle. Do you want someone with high performance but low trust? Or do you want someone with high trust and low performance? What those words mean to you will change your answer and everyone will have a slightly different preference. But as Nathaniel brought up, English is a very difficult language. Not only to speak and write, but also to learn. Now, I personally only speak English. I've only ever spoken English. I did a couple of languages at school, but that was it. And I still make spelling errors, grammar errors, and I fumble over my words a lot. It's just I cut it out of the video. <laughs> but they are the nuances in communication that allows us to develop our way of communicating through speech, through written communication, and just learning knowledge in general. Passion, focus, flow, intrinsic motivation. That is the cycle Stephen spoke about when moving forwards and getting into flow. You need a passion, but how do you find a passion? Make a list of things you care about. Find connections between three or four of those things. Build on those things over time, developing your expertise. Go public and share what you know getting some feedback, adjust if you need, then list the big problems in the world and try and find a solution that matches the things that you have in your passion and that becomes your purpose. 
Now, I read this a couple of days ago, but looking into the entrepreneurial journeys of many of the individuals being creators, being in business, whoever they are, it's literally what they all do. It is certainly what I did to find a passion that I'm interested in and a purpose that I can follow. Productivity, interest, human performance, interest, philosophy, interest, free education online for anyone to access. I'm doing what I want to do. But burnout is a thing and people with passion, people with drive, people that love to work sometimes forget to take a break. And from Nest Labs took a different approach and spoke about bore out, which is essentially the opposite. Burnout being you have overloaded yourself with work, bore out being you have underloaded yourself with work. Now, I came across this a couple of times when trying to find a job after graduating my master's degree, and a lot of the people said, well, we don't want you working here because you will get bored. It's not mentally or physically challenging enough for you, so you will leave and go somewhere else, which is understandable when thinking about it because they want an employee for as long as possible and if I can get a job or I need to go somewhere else because I'm just bored out of my brains, I won't be there for long. And this is interesting because something James Clear mentioned in his newsletter. Strangely, life gets harder when you try to make it easy. Exercising might be hard, but never moving makes life harder. Uncontrollable conversations are hard, but avoiding every conflict is harder. Mastering your craft is hard, but having no skills is harder. Easy has a cost. So making things too easy could be close to or even the same as making things too hard. And it's not just easy because something Lara is experiencing at the moment. If you over minimize things, you come up with the same sort of issue. So being in that zone in the middle, in the Goldilocks zone, is where we want to be. For peak performance, that is the flow state. And Stephen goes on to say that that's in the middle of the alpha brainwaves and the theta brainwaves. Alpha is associated with daydreaming, and theta is associated with REM sleep, or the moment just before going to sleep, and the flow state is somewhere in the middle of those two. He used the term hypofrontality, which is basically where your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain in charge of executive thinking executive functions turns off executive functions which is a set of skills for flexible thinking in your working memory and some self-control essentially saying that neurochemical neuroelectrical and neuroatomical changes in the brain actually help us in the flow state to be more creative and actually get lots of work done an interesting little hack he did bring up about reading which i thought was pretty cool is when you move your finger across the line to speed read you use your finger to guide you which i think most of us know if you use your left finger you're activating the right side of your brain now that is the creative side of your brain so if you use your left finger to help yourself speed read you could actually be more creative with what it is that you're reading which hasn't been backed up to what i know but it's an interesting idea now whether you are reading books watching videos listening to podcasts there is no longer a scarcity of knowledge like we had in the past we now have a scarcity of focus or scarcity of attention which mark manson was talking about the attention economy being the issue with all of marketing and sales looking for our attention now seth does also back this up in his podcast episode and he brought up a really interesting thought about the algorithm the algorithm is focused on attention not education, which I'll bring up later on, but it's trying to create interest. So it's turning a little interest into a big interest, potentially an obsession, something I know all of us have done. We all go onto YouTube or social media. We have a small interest in something. We die deep down that rabbit hole. And two hours later, we love something that two hours ago, we never even knew existed. Digital tools is a perfect example of this. You find a video about it. And then suddenly three hours later, you're going to adopt the tool and use it for the rest of your life. Now, with our attention and trust being pulled all over the place because we need to trust the people and sources that we're consuming, as Seth Godin was saying, flow state is very difficult to find. Ali was saying that in his previous study videos, they were long streams, but only three to four hours of them were actually focused work. And that's what he tries to do. He tries to get four to five focus hours of work a day. He then said focus is like a muscle. Now, I know every analogy breaks down to a certain point, but focus is extremely susceptible. A ping, a thought, an idea, a noise, all the different psychological elements that affect your emotions and your feelings. And then you have the normal physical hygiene fundamentals like exercise, sleep, nutrition, all of those playing an impact. And you can try so hard to get all of that right and still not focus. 
Whereas a muscle, if you use it, it grows. If you use it more than it can currently do over a period of time, it will grow more. Yes, there are still factors that impact skill acquisition, hypertrophy, and performance of a lift or movement on a specific day, but it's nowhere near as susceptible to impact and outside factors than focus. Now, this is just my opinion from my experience and my research into the world of muscles and focus, but I'd be interesting to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. But speaking of lift, Lifting and muscles, Stephen spoke about the corporate athlete, living like a corporate athlete, which is basically using different principles from muscle growth, so super compensation and active recovery in your life, alongside having a binary work ethic and using the flow state. So living like a corporate athlete, you do lots of work, then you have a stage of active recovery, which allows for super compensation, your baseline of work to slightly increase. And that is a principle from muscle growth and hypertrophy. And then the binary work ethic being you're either working or you're not, don't do a gray zone, don't have a gray zone, you're either working or you're not. And then the flow state, try to use the flow state as much as possible. So you're working in the flow state or you're not working. This is something I've been doing for years, mainly because my education and my, my background is in strength and conditioning and working with performance athletes and being a sports coach, which is why most of my life is revolved around periodization and managing my energy, which is what my note collection is all about. Expanding this thought out a little bit, Stephen spoke about the green zone. Now, when we look at endurance athletes and elite athletes, they don't train in the red zone. No pain, no gain. That's not where they train. And they don't train in the zone below that either. They train in the green zone. So it's just above their baseline, slightly overreaching and then going below to allow for recovery. And that green zone is where most of the training is. It's not about pushing all the time. It's about being consistent over a long period of time, not getting injured and avoiding burnout and overtraining. Tom is someone that has been researching this stuff and speaking with professionals for a long time, and he shared his daily routine. Now, most of it is what you expected, exercise, meditation, balanced diet, etc. But with his diet, he said something that was really interesting. He does a 17-hour intermittent fast every single day day 17 hours and he doesn't hydrate he doesn't drink anything after the hours so he drinks after 8 8 a.m in the morning but nothing after 2 p.m in the afternoon something i need to do a little bit more research on and he also tapes his mouth at night which i've seen ali do i've seen some other creators do but i need to understand that more before i even attempt to give that a go Social media is awful. Research shows it incentivizes hate and division. Not wrong, but it is great for collaboration, getting new insights, talking with new people, and keeping up with the news. Steve tweeted about this in a great thread and came up with loads of different points on how he manages social media. A lot of them is things that I mentioned in the last video about consuming information. But one thing he does do, which I thought, yes, I love it, is that when there is a conversation that he's having on social media that he thinks, you know what, this deserves a face-to-face -face conversation, he takes it offline and has a conversation. That's why I have my schedule on my website, so if anyone has a conversation with me, wants to talk with me, or when they have a conversation online, you're like, I really need to dig into this, just book a call and have a conversation. This endless feed of news can lead to a bit of scatterbrain, as Seth spoke about last week, creating your own narrative, living in the narrative that you want. And like Seth spoke about this week in the podcast, you can be scatterbrain all over the place and dive down rabbit holes. And something else Thomas and Martin spoke about in their episode of the Inforum, where they did say it's going to end. But they did mention, Martin specifically, that Twitter... He's looking at news. He's looking at things that have happened miles away from him. He can't do anything about it. He cannot impact it in any way, but he's still consuming that information, which is actually causing him to be a little bit stressed because he's consuming stuff that he has no impact on and he can't change. Dealing with those emotions and feelings is difficult, but Judd came up again. Judd is someone that I found years ago and helped me through my anxiety, and he had another conversation with Michael Garveus on his podcast and spoke about how to control emotions and feelings and avoiding the anxiety worry loop. The framework he uses is trigger behavior response, and there are loads of examples all over the place, and I don't want to do it a disjustice by explaining it here, so if you're interested in getting through the worry loop or an anxiety loop, I've left the link to the conversation in the description below. Having hard conversations is not easy with yourself or with others, but James Clear did say you should be having hard conversations, and 
Tom said that having hard conversations is how he builds his culture in his business. Working with others certainly has a challenge, but when you are open and you are blunt with your conversation, you can actually move forwards. Now, when you're taking notes on those conversations or trying to understand what's going on, you want to be able to understand when you're reviewing those later on. This goes to communication in developing a culture in a business and taking notes on literally anything else. And something cultivated management brought up in the note-taking world, which was an interesting thought, is instead of thinking about the Feynman technique when looking at notes, just ask yourself, will I understand this in 60 days? And I thought, you know what? That's a good question. And this is where the idea of bottom-up note-taking comes in. I'm going over it in more detail in my note-taking series, but Tom was saying that he takes notes, he takes little points from all the conversations that he has that are blunt conversations, and then builds out his ideals, his guidance for the business from those notes, which is that atomic note structure, taking small points, building up a process note, bottom-up note-taking, and then using that process note in something tangible. A nice nugget from Maggie's summarization of the building a second brace course illustrated through images, which is really nice, is to use placeholders for where you are, telling you, okay, this is where I was thinking, this is what I was thinking about, this is the next connection, and taking that essentially checkpoint for reviewing later on. I personally already do this in my note taking and I use comments in Obsidian so I don't actually see them unless I'm actually working on something. And there was a great thread speaking about tech ed that goes all in depth into pedagogy basically saying that the reason technology isn't taking over education right now is very similar to what Seth was saying earlier. Technology is about attention, not education. You have to actively look in the tech to find ways of learning, which is where the algorithm needs to either change for learning's sake or the individual using the tech needs to change how they use it. And one of the biggest takeaways from the thread was actually brought up in a Vlogbrothers video. And they said that they actually learned just as much, maybe even more from the videos they plan out and not do than the videos that they actually do. And of course, a tweet from Feynman just reinforces this idea. The problem is not people being uneducated. The problem is that people are educated just enough to believe what they have to be taught and not educated enough to question anything from what they've been taught. So stay curious. And until next Monday, get off YouTube and do something productive with your time instead.